Welcome to Dr. B Music Theory. I had a really great question from one of my subscribers, Eunice, who wrote to me. I am so sorry, I'm still a little bit confused. If you can see in these songs by an artist called Kashmir, he gives me a list of, of pieces. And I'm going to like take a look, close look at the first one. In the key of C minor, he uses the minor five chord, and in the end, he uses in the melody the B note. It should be the five major underneath, a major five chord underneath, but he keeps it blank. As you can see, the chord progression in the link is one, six, subtonic seven, minor five, then one, six, subtonic seven, and a blank. Or if it's a blank, then he is free to put any note of the C minor scale. Um, check the link to understand what I mean. So. Hook, he, and he gives me a link to Hook Music Theory, which, which is a great website that has tons of, of really awesome content. Um, and so let's, let's take, a, take a minute and, and go ahead and click on that link, which, which I'm going to put below in the comments. But I'm going to play it right here for you just for a, a second so you can hear what it sounds within this video. So let me play let me play that on the piano as well, so you can hear hear the co kind of comparison uh, of of the original electronic version. There's some great questions in, in what was being asked here. So let's take a look to understand what's going on. This is, this is coming from a perspective of having studied traditional Western music theory. How do we explain electronic music? Uh, and so we have our Roman numeral analysis, right? So we start we're, we're firmly in the key of C minor. We start on a one chord, we then go to a six chord. There's nothing unusual about that. That's a very traditional, one can go to anything, so there's, there's no, nothing remarkable about that. We then go from six to the seven chord. This is a little bit unusual in Western music. Um, and, and it begs a, a quick discussion on the difference between a progression, a retrogression, and then we can go further from there. So, when we're talking about Western classical music, we're really talking about harmonic progression. And the word progression can be used in the more general sense of simply meaning chord changes, how the chords change, or more specifically, and in this case I'm going to use it in the more specific version of that term. Progression meaning forward goal-oriented harmonic motion. Let me say that again. Forward goal-oriented harmonic motion where it feels like you are, if we're going to make an analogy for a, a, a novel or a movie, it feels like there's, there's something coming, we're going somewhere, there's a journey that's being undertaken, the hero's journey, what have you. And that's what, we, when we talk about harmonic progression in music theory, that's what usually what we're talking about, that goal-oriented. Now, there's other types of harmonic progression in the sense of chord changes that don't feel like they're going somewhere. They feel like they're just floating in a certain area. And composers such as Claude Debussy and the Impressionist composers made use of that extensively where you might have a Debussy piece like uh, Nuages, which was clouds. It feels like you're laying on the grass looking up at the sky watching clouds. You're not going anywhere. It's, it's more of a more of a feeling of stasis. But that's a different kind of sensibility aesthetically, and because of that, it requires different harmonic motion. All, all of these things are important for us to understand, both as listeners, as well as composers, arrangers, appreciators of music. So when we go from six to seven here, 
that is not a, a goal-oriented progression. It kind of breaks our chart of harmonic progression. What it is, is really more of a shift. It's a sideways shift. It's, why does it, why does it sound good? And this is something that I'll often hear is people say, Dr. B, you say that's wrong. Six can't go to seven, but it sounds fine to me. And I really have two responses to that. One is, how finely tuned is your ear? How well are you able to differentiate when something really sounds good and when it doesn't? Um, so developing a really good ear is an important component. The other is, in what context, in what style does it sound good or, or bad? If I'm going along writing traditional Bach chorale harmonic progressions and then all of a sudden I have a whole sequence of parallel fifths, parallel octaves, and non-progressions, that's going to sound out of place. It's going to sound wrong in the context of the style. But here, we're in an electronic music style. It has some different, different rules. And here, a sideways shift sounds really nice, sounds great, it does sound good. So in addition to that sideways shift, it's, it's a seven chord. So it is still diatonic to our key. So it's pretty much anything that's diatonic isn't gonna sound horrible, it's still in the key. And in addition, we're going from the A flat up to a B flat. And that's up a scale. And the human ear loves to hear the scale. So I call that power of the scale. Whether you're going up a scale or down a scale, the ear will forgive unusual harmonic progressions if you're using what I call the power of the scale. So that's how we explain this motion. And, that, and it is unusual, so we, we do want to note that. We do want to say, listen, six to seven is an unusual progression. How does it work? Why does it work? Then, it goes to a minor five chord. Five, normally in, in our style, we would expect it to be a major sonority. We would expect to raise the leading tone, have a major five chord. But here, it's still a diatonic chord. So we're continuing this idea of diatonic chords. It's in the key, right? So it's not gonna sound crazy. But in addition to that, we've now established a bit of a pattern. If you look, C minor to A flat major, the root movement is down a third. And root movement is also a critical component of progressions. Here, we go B flat down to G. So here we have descending third, and here we have descending third. So it sounds like a sequence. And a sequence allows you to kind of break the normal harmonic progression rules by establishing a pattern. And that pattern, the human ear will latch onto that pattern and it will allow composers to override what, what your, the ear would normally want to hear as a progression. So we get... Right? It's a sequence. We got... C you get that sequence. So sequence, shift, up a major, up uh, or rather down, down a major second in the case of that, that initial movement, but we stay diatonic. So our ears, even though this is unexpected, the, it makes sense. There's a, there's a rhyme and reason. And that's one of the important things when you study music theory is to understand kind of what the rules are, what the expectations are, and then figuring out that there's there's other rules that are almost like override, like upper level rules, where you have like the power of the scale, you have sequences, and it allows you to quote unquote break the rules. Uh, it, in a certain sense, I don't even like to use the word rules, it's more of like expectations. And if you establish a different set of expectations, it will work. As composers, as listeners of music, the problem is, as we're developing is if we don't have an upper level rule to replace the lower level rule, that's where com composing can start to sound wrong or bad. So as we're studying, we're trying to figure out what will make sense to the ear and not only make sense to the ear, but elicit certain emotions. That's our primary goal. 
So let's keep that in mind as we move forward. When we move to our fifth measure, we go back to C minor. Now as soon as we do that, especially with the melody repeating, it makes it sound like this: these first four measures are a phrase, a unit. However, we go back to one, but it's, it's not the five-one relationship we would expect, because we normally would have an uppercase five. But root movement is important, I'll say that again, and that root movement of alone of a dominant to a tonic scale degree really sounds right. So that's another reason why this progression is a little unusual, this progression is a little unusual, but I'm giving you the reasons on why it still works, why it still sounds right. We go back to our one chord. We repeat that phrase. We go to the sixth chord. Immediately, as soon as we do that, we've established symmetry between the first four measures and the second four measures. It's a repetition, and it's exact repeat for measures five and six. In measure seven, we, we have the same chord progression, but we have a different melody, and we're gonna talk about the melody shortly. But we go to the seven chord, everything symmetrical. One chord, first measure, fifth measure, one chords, six chords, seven chords. So one, first measure, fifth measure, second measure, sixth measure, third measure, seventh measure, fourth measure, and the eighth measure, there's no written chord. But Eunice knows that there's something implied here. There's an implied chord. And if we look, D, C, B natural, G, F, this is absolutely 100% a 5-7 chord. And it's implied. So when, when the question was originally asked, and, and a part of it said, uh, if it's a blank, meaning a blank chord, then he is free to put any note of the C minor scale? Um, sure, yeah, that's true. In this case, the notes he choose imply the 5-7. Now, why is that the best choice he could have done? Uh, is, is, you know, he could choose any notes. Why these? Well, look at the amazing symmetry here, right? We start and we end the first one with a minor 5, and here we switch it to the major 5. This makes it seem like a larger eight measure structure, almost like how when we talk about uh, parallel periods, you have that kind of weak cadence, strong cadence. In this case, this establishes one larger phrase almost, ending in a, in a definitely a weak cadence, and then it goes back to C minor, right? So we establish this eight measure form, and it, it makes a lot of sense, so that the, the the, the expectation and so when, when a, the expectation of hearing that raised leading tone to lead us back to one, it's denied here. But you get it later, right? And that's one of the awesome things about comp composers is they'll play with our expectations. They know what the rules are. They know what we expect to hear. And sometimes they'll frustrate us by not giving what we expect. And then the gratification we have as listeners get when they actually give us what we expected is just so awesome that it makes the music very exciting. So that's, that's how we're going to talk about the harmony to understand why these chord progressions sound great. And, and as we talk about progressions, we talked about sequence, we talked about the shift. The retrogression is another concept just to keep in mind. Uh, we don't really have it in this piece, but the idea of a progression where it's, you expect, for instance, three chord to go to the sixth chord to a two chord to a five chord but you can go backwards through that and that's called a retrogression it sounds like you're taking a step back so we have progression taking a step forward retrogression taking a step back sideways shift and then we have a sequence which kind of feels like is is, a, is the same concept of that shift they're they're kind of similar because it feels like a pattern that goes this that this that this that these are all harmonic concepts that are important for us to remember Let's take a look at the, 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 the melody to analyze this aspect. So, as you look, you will notice that most of the pitches used are chord tones. They are part of the chord occurring. So, right here, we start, and these are the root, the one of the chord. So one, 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 and then we have a non-chord tone. 
We'll come back to that. Then we go to the A flat major triad, so this C becomes the three, three, the B flat is a non chord tone, the C is the third, the A flat is the root, and then the G is a non chord tone. So we're analyzing the melody. We're going to keep going. We go to a B flat major triad, D is the third, we have another D, three, 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 the E flat is a non chord tone. Then we have a D on a G minor, that is the fifth, G is one, then non chord tone, non chord tone, non chord tone. Three in a row. Hmm, what's going on here? Very interesting, yes? We then repeat, so we have the same thing root, 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 non chord tone, third, third, non chord, non -chord tone, third, root, non chord tone, actually, yeah, non chord tone. Then we go to the B flat, here the melody changes. This is going to be one of our most and interesting things. We go and then go to the five, 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 non chord tone, and then since we imply the five seven, we can analyze it as such. We can say five, non chord tone, three, one, seven. So let's take a look at our non chord tones and see what we can learn about this melody. So the, the non chord tone in measure one. It's a B flat, it's prepared by step down and resolved by step up. That is a neighbor tone. In this case, a lower neighbor. Really common, it occurs on a weak beat. This is textbook neighbor tone. We then have that again in the second measure, C, step down to B flat, step back up to C to resolve. That's another neighbor tone, the same kind. We're developing a, a, a kind of a motive here by using that. Leap up to the A flat, step down to the G. Now this G is prepared by step and resolved by leap in the same direction. That's none of the traditional non chord tones, right? So that's a bit of a mystery. It's not a passing tone, it's not a neighbor tone, it's not a suspension, it's not a retardation, it's not an appoggiatura, it's not an escape tone. What's going on here? Um, in general, sometimes music theorists, if they can't, if it doesn't fit any things, they call it a free tone. Kind of like the whatever tone, right? But we're going to find that this G is probably what gives this melody its most character. In one sense, we could say, well, it's the G just makes it into an A flat major seven sonority. So we get a major seven, and it's all stacked third. So even though that note's a non chord tone, it doesn't sound too crazy. It sounds like we could just say it's a major seven. But if we say that, it doesn't resolve as a seventh would. We would expect a seventh to resolve. So free tone for now. Then let's see why this free tone is so satisfying in the end. We continue. We get into measure three, we have an E flat prepared by step up and then resolved by step down. That is a neighbor tone. This time it is an upper neighbor instead of a lower neighbor that we have in measures one and two. We then have this measure where it looks like it's going to be a passing tone, a passing tone, but then it never goes to the D. We can have two passing tones in a row. So G, you know. would be resolving to a D instead of the C would be totally normal. We, we could find that, but it doesn't. It goes to a C. Um, and in this case, if we, we, you know, or we could be actually, could say that this, this second one that I labeled as a passing tone, more accurately, I'd have to call it a free tone. I mean, we, as we're hearing it, we'd expect it to be a passing tone, but in fact, it's more of a, a free tone because the F is prepared by step, resolved by step, the E flat's prepared by step and resolved by leap in the same direction. Uh, the C is prepared by leap and resolved by common tone. That's an anticipation. So this is a bit unusual, but if we take it together, in our key, it sounds like a minor pentatonic. And 
the pentatonic is a sound that is so easy to superimpose upon chords. This is common in the blues and certain styles of rock and pop music to have these pentatonics, especially the minor pentatonic. So it makes it kind of sound a little bit bluesy. We get that minor pentatonic sound. We can analyze it, passing tone, free tone, anticipation. It's a little unusual. As a whole, we can say, oh, it's a, it's a minor pentatonic of our key. It creates a little bit more tension. And then, of course, we resolve right back to chord tones again. So we do that. We have our neighbor tone again in measure five, our neighbor tone again. And now, this is what I want to was so excited to point out for it to you all. This G that was a free tone in the first phrase becomes a passing tone in the second phrase. <laughs> and, and it kind of really, the melody here reinforces what the harmony is doing. The harmony is saying, we're going to end on a minor five against your expectations. And then the, the second phrase, we're going to give you your expectations. And here, it has a non-core tone, the G, that defies your expectations. It's a free tone. It doesn't resolve as expected. But we're going to do what's expected in the second phrase. So it's, in a certain sense, it's kind of genius that you have both melodically and harmonically something that's going against the listener's expectations. And then in the second phrase, it's almost exactly the same, but it, it kind of like fixes those two things that were left unresolved in the first phrase. Because here we just go A flat, G, step to the F. Here, in measure 7, we have another free tone. So again, we have a bit of symmetry. This free tone here, where you have step and then leap, step, then leap. And again, this one is a leap of a perfect fourth. This is a perfect fifth. We have those, those that, that leap of a fourth or fifth, which it can be inverted. It's really strong. It's... It's like circle of fists type of stuff. It sounds right to our ear. So even though it's a free tone, it's not a free tone into something that's completely bizarre or using leaps that are completely uh, unusual and hard for the ear to hear. They're, they're free tones with leaps that are part of the circle of fifths. So when a composer tries to do something that's a little bit unusual, how unusual? How unusual can you go and have it still make sense to human beings listen to it. In this case, it's a little bit unusual, which gives it its interest, but has something we can latch onto. And then the 5-7, the C here in measure 8, is simply a passing tone. All right? So, really interesting stuff. Electronic music. At first blush, you might say, is at odds with all the music theory we've studied, and you say, ah, this old music theory stuff that only applied back in the 17th and 18th century. No one does that anymore. It's, that's not true. You, we can apply almost everything we know from studying Western music theory to modern music, electronic music. And we can say, look, these things that are a little bit unusual, we can explain why they still work, why they still make sense to our human ear. And then we can take that knowledge and use it to create music harmonically that's, that has influences from many, many diverse styles of music. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you click on the link and listen to Kashmir's entire, entire song, uh, whole, whole track, and I hope you enjoyed this episode of Dr. B Music Theory.